Um, this year we'll be in Davis, next year we'll be in Fort Collins, Colorado, and then we'll be moving um, further east the year, uh, the year following. Uh, so we hope that you will connect with us at one of those conferences. And there's, there's no better place to uh, get great natural areas information from the sources. Um, we've got over, well over 100 presenters at those conferences, and, it's, and, and so much of the great learning happens um, you know, just in the informal gatherings of our members. Uh, and so, so the conference is really um, one of our flagships. The second flagship for us is our Natural Areas Journal. We've been publishing this peer-reviewed scientific um, journal for over 30 years, and we're quite proud of it. We will be, um, for anybody that is a member and knows us and is connected to our journal, you will be uh, receiving in your inboxes in September a special issue dedicated to um, managing for pollinators on natural areas. That's on the heels of a special issue that we did about a year ago um, that was, uh, the focus was uh, managing, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, using native plant materials in natural areas restoration. So these are really uh, wonderful resource documents. Um, connect with us, uh, be in touch with us if you have any questions about how you might get your hands on one of those journals. So, um, and then our webinar series, we're constantly looking for ways to get information into the hands of the people that need it most. Those folks that are on the ground uh, conserving natural areas into the now and into the future. Um, so, as Kate mentioned, this webinar series is, is one of the ways that we're doing at the Conference and Journal also, and we'll be looking for um, uh, other opportunities in the near future um, as well. Uh, in addition to, to some of those uh, outreach, some of the outreach and programming, we also work at an advocacy level for our programs. We've got members who work within the federal land management agencies, the state natural areas programs, and folks that work for private conservation outfits like land trusts and museums, um, as well as a, a, a very strong academic uh, following. So we know that um, oftentimes uh, it takes an organization like NAA to be a voice for those programs, not just um, in terms of providing adequate funding or making sure funding sources are, um, are, are available, but also um, advocating for the things that are important to you and your work. So be in touch with us. Let us know. We, we love to hear from you. Um, we would welcome the opportunity to chat about ways that we can help support you further. Enjoy your webinar. And thanks again, Ben, for being willing to do this for us today. All right. And just a couple of housekeeping things before we uh, introduce Ben. Oh, we also wanted to thank our partner, the Bureau of Land Management. They're supporting us in presenting this series, and we're very grateful for the support. So. Um, our next webinar is going to be in November, on November 10th, and we're looking forward to some really interesting stuff from Paul Gobster from the U.S. Forest Service. He's going to be talking about kind of the human element in all of this, um, strategies for building public support. So that's kind of been his big thing, and he's going to talk to us about that, but that will be after the conference. So um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we ask that you use the Q&A to ask questions of Ben. Uh, you can use the, the chat if you want, but um, our system doesn't keep track of those questions, and so it's usually better for us to use the Q&A. Um, and he will have a couple breaks for, for uh, he has a, we'll have a break in the middle for questions, and um, of course we'll have some questions at the end too. Um, a little bit about Ben, um, we're really happy he's here with us. Um, he's from the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, you can see some of his bona fides there. Um, I think some of the things that people might be interested in hearing about him is that during dissertation research, he became fascinated with birds and how they're responding to climate change, although this um, presentation will cover more than that. Um, and he's an advocate for uh, volunteers in the public and data collection. So, all right, uh, with that, let me hand it over to Ben. Great. Uh, thanks, Kate. Can everyone hear me okay? And uh, Katie, uh, in terms of um, um, the, the presentation, I'm just going to get started, but if people can't see uh slide or uh, they have any trouble um, um, 
with any of the slides or seeing it, please just let us know through the chat feature. So um, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, in terms of uh, what I'd like to go over, this idea of how modern climate change may be influencing wildlife populations, uh, and really with this idea of how do we actually go about understanding vulnerability and conservation in a novel future. Um, and I'm not going to kind of go too much into sort of what we know in terms of the climate science, uh, but I'm definitely going to kind of set the stage a little bit. And what we've seen over the last hundred years is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, we've seen uh, fairly strong changes in, uh, in rising global temperatures. And uh, what I would say is that that real change has started roughly in the late 1970s, where we've seen this sort of exponential increase in global uh, average temperatures that have kind of ticked up every year. And every decade, every preceding decade has generally been sort of warmer as we've gone on since about 1980 or so. And so we just kind of keep on breaking records. Uh, what we do know from this is that um, warming temperatures are not something that's kind of occurring the same way throughout the world. Uh, you can see those sort of dark purple areas, we've actually seen increases of more than sort of 1.75 or about two degrees overall over the last 100 years. And a lot of that tends to be kind of in these northerly latitudes. Um, and we are definitely seeing warming in parts of, let's say, South America, as you can see there as well. But when we start looking at this as a global phenomenon, these sort of northerly latitudes um, uh, tend to be, um, sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, I'm getting a message here that people can't see it, so I'm just going to make sure. Just try to reshare, Ben. I think it'll probably work then. Yep, oh. we got it. We got it now? We got it. All right. So let's try this. Uh, I'll just kind of start from here then. Uh, that we've seen increases in temperatures uh, overall for the last uh, 100 years or so. Um, and, uh, and some of that does be said to be disproportionately more in these sort of northerly latitudes. Um, in terms of what we know about what's going on in the future then, you can see these sort of increases both in terms of the temperature on the left here where you see sort of the late 20th century, the middle 21st century, and then so sort of the late 21st century. And what I would take or what I would say is that uh, what we've seen over the last 100 years, well, uh, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, the future projections suggest that we've seen, uh, we're going to see upwards of about six degrees or anywhere from four to six degrees increase in, in global average temperatures. And precipitation tends to be a little bit more of a complicated story. Uh, some areas are getting drier, some areas are getting wetter. In general, what people are suggesting, though, is that those uh, differences are only going to become stronger in the future. And definitely, if you can look at sort of the southwestern part of the United States, that's an area that's going to um, almost certainly become increasingly more dry with these sort of increasing examples of um, mega droughts occurring in the future. So, okay, then it leads us to this question that I'd like to tackle today, which is how will wildlife species respond to this? And ultimately, wildlife really honestly have kind of three options. They can either adapt. And so certainly species are very good at adapting to environmental change. Uh, we've been able to document this over time, over multiple species. Um, and of course, we've had species that have evolved through pretty amazing changes from glacial periods to interglacial periods. So there obviously is some ability and capacity for species to adapt to that change. At the same time, species can move, of course. They can change their ranges, their distributions, um, and they can sort of move across the Earth's surface in, sort of in varying sort of rates and, and abilities. Um, and of course, the last uh, example here is they can't do either of those, uh, and they will either become extinct as a species or become extirpated as a population. Um, and those are kind of what we think of as so the three main responses. Um, most, a lot of people do tend to think uh, that species will simply adapt to climate change. Um, and I would offer kind of a couple of things to uh, keep in mind, uh, that although we have seen some pretty amazing changes uh, in the Earth's climate over you know, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, from glacial to interglacial periods, um, it's an important aspect of what we've seen is that the rate of warming just over the last 30 to 40 years is potentially unprecedented. In fact, the last 30-year period is, more, is the one of the warmest 30-year periods over the last 1,500 years. And so this rate of warming um, really may be completely outside the bounds of what most species are adapted to. 
The other really important component here is that we have altered the Earth's template. More than 40% of the Earth's surface is now tied up in agriculture. We have a human population that's exceeding 7 billion throughout the world. And so these two things, to me, are fundamentally different when we start uh, trying to assess whether or not species can or will uh, adapt to climate change. So one of the two components I'd like us to think about, uh, or how, how we um, try to think about in terms of conservation, is that species really have these two different uh, metrics when we think about whether or not they are vulnerable to climate change. Uh, one of them is this idea of sensitivity. And it's actually you know, pretty straightforward that um, some species just have physiological limits to climate. We have physiological limits. We have critical temperatures. Uh, some species are more or less specialized to certain kinds of habitats, like wetlands and forests. And some species have really, really important interactions with other species in terms of predators and prey. At the same time, uh, certain populations of species are more or less exposed to these changes in climate. As I've kind of shown you in those maps, Climate change is not this homogenous process. It's very variable across space and time. Some areas are getting warmer or cooler in some cases. Uh, the rate of warming is different. Um, and because of that, whether or not a population of a species is more or less exposed uh, to that climate change uh, can vary uh, pretty significantly. So these two components then of sensitivity and exposure feed into this idea of trying to assess vulnerability for different species. And ultimately, the idea of what we try to think about then is how do we actually then do through conservation, then mitigate or reduce that sensitivity and that exposure to ultimately reduce that vulnerability. So I'm gonna kind of go through three responses um, and examples of these from sort of ranges or changes in ranges, changes in communities, and changes in demography of species. And I'm gonna kind of take and cherry pick from some of the work we've been conducting in my lab over the last five years or so, it's kind of good examples of these. So first, this idea of ranges. So ranges really are a very important tool in conservation. Ultimately, they, they capture where species are and are not found. Um, and there are, there's been a lot of work as to how climate can influence or limit these ranges. And one of, when we first started thinking about how climate change can affect species, um, we actually started thinking about this idea of rain shifts. And really the prediction here is that if we've had warming over the last 30 to 40 years, then what we would expect to see is that many species who are maybe warm adapted or southerly adapted species might in fact be shifting their ranges northward. At the same time, these species that are kind of cold adapted, let's say in the blue here, um, or winter adapted species might actually have the opposite response. They may actually also shift northward. And so this idea of a poleward shift or northward shift in species ranges really does sort of encapsulate one of the main predictions of uh, how species might respond to climate change. So we've been looking at this, uh, multiple people, multiple studies, multiple geographies, and multiple countries throughout the world. And what we've kind of come to, to a consensus about is that in fact, more than half of the observed animal range boundaries in the world have actually already shown a response to modern climate change in this direction that we would predict, these northward, poleward shifts. But what we don't know is what are some of the mechanisms then that might be driving some of these poleward shifts. And a really kind of cool example of this that I'm gonna talk about right now are, um, is an example of the snowshoe hair. So this is one of those cold winter adapted species. You can see that most of their distribution, their range actually is focused uh, and sort of encompasses that boreal Canada region. And if we're here in Wisconsin, or at least I'm here in Wisconsin, you can see that that southern range boundary sort of terminates, right, sort of throughout the upper Midwest. And so if we were really interested in trying to identify this mechanism of what's driving these range boundaries uh, or this range shift, range boundaries are a really good way to do that. So snowshoe hair do this really interesting or have this very specific adaptation um, to winter, and one of them, and it, pro and one of them is this idea that of camouflage. So, if you go out into the forest in the summer and you kick up a snowshoe here, chances are it's going to look a lot like this. It's brown coat color, and as it kind of goes through winter, if you're kind of in the winter landscape and you come across that same snowshoe here, it's going to look a lot more on your right, covered in white. So, the idea behind this coat color change 
That is obviously an adaptation to the winter climate. Some really cool work by a guy named Scott Mills, who is a professor at Montana, has shown that this sort of change in coat color is actually driven primarily by day lengths. So as the days get shorter, there are certain hormones that kind of kick in. And as you kind of go through, uh, through that progression, they make this change from this brown to this white to match their sort of winter background. So the interesting thing here is that this isn't driven by snow cover, it's not driven by temperature, it's really driven by photo period, by day lengths. And as we all know, day lengths really doesn't change very much over the years. But what is changing is this background snow cover. And what Scott has shown is that the more mismatch you get between sort of coat color and the background, the more dire the consequences are for snowshoe hair. And so he's termed this idea, this idea of phenotypic mismatch and the phenotype being this coat color change, and it's being increasingly mismatched with a background that is no longer white, no longer covered in snow. So really, okay, what's the problem here, right? Well, the problem is this. You get uh, white hair on a brown background, and that's in the middle of winter, you have less snow cover, and the problem with this, obviously, is that there's a lot of things that like to eat snowshoe hair. And so the more mismatch you are, Scott's found that, in fact, the more likely you are to not survive that winter. So ultimately, one of the things we wanted to look into is whether or not then speed, that snowshoe hair in Wisconsin are changing your range over time. If, in fact, we are seeing this warming period and we're getting a change in snow cover, presumably, are we actually seeing that this range is changing, this range boundary? And so the nice thing about working in Wisconsin, we've got guys like Aldo Leopold who in 1944 went out and surveyed where snowshoe hair were. And then another couple of guys, uh, Lloyd Keese and Dave Bueller in 1979 and 80 actually went out and revisited some of these same sites. And what I've kind of point out there are those black dots are where uh, they were finding snowshoe hair in the, 70, in the late 70s that corresponded to that 1944 period. And what they documented was already in the late 1970s is sort of contraction northward. Some areas they were expanding into, uh, but this general sort of beginning of a contraction. And what uh, the 1970s research, researchers, Lloyd and uh, Dave, basically suggested that this was being driven by forest cover loss and habitat loss, agricultural sort of expansion into forested areas. So, at the same time though, right about in the 1970s or so, we started seeing a pretty tremendous change in snow cover throughout much of the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, in the upper Midwest, this loss of snow cover has been so much that our months of maximum snow cover has actually shifted from February to January. We've seen an accelerated spring melt by almost two weeks. And between that same period of the late 1970s to now, there's been a rate of decrease, especially in spring, of about seven to 11% from much of the Northern Hemisphere. So we are getting this shorter and shorter winter season. So we went out there and we actually went back about two years ago to see where snowshoe hair are. And those black dots are where we visited but did not find them. They were historically found in the 1970s, we did not find them. Uh, and then those red dots are where their current presence is now. Um, and that those white dots are where they were absent from in the historical and now. And so what you can see here is this continued range boundary retraction where we weren't finding them in many of the same sort of areas that they were normally occupying in the late 1970s. Furthermore, when we looked at what was really driving this sort of range boundary or limiting this range boundary, we looked at forest cover and we looked at snow cover duration. And what we found was that in the historical time period, those late 1970s, you can see that range map, and that's a model of where uh, snowshoe hair are and are not found, that that model, what was the most important component driving their distribution, was in fact forest fragmentation and to a lesser extent, snow cover duration. That's the current model on the right, and that is almost driven primarily by snow cover duration, meaning that we see this flip-flop going on, in the late 1970s, forest fragmentation and habitat loss was really the most important thing. And now we're seeing this become actually inverted where snow cover is actually much more important. When we actually model this into the future, and we say, okay, let's say everything stops and we snow cover no longer begins to change or attenuate or become shorter. That's, that's um, 
that on the bottom left is where we see that change that change in this in their distribution in the next 50 years and that on the right is actually what we expect to see as snow cover begins to lessen so what we see is that snow cover duration the loss of the winter season is beginning to push snowshoe hares right out of wisconsin an area that they've formerly been very abundant in so that was just an example of this idea of rain shifts and what could potentially be driving the mechanism behind why species might be pushing more and more northward or forward over time. Okay, so that's a really good sort of species example. The other question that a lot of people have though, if you have all these range boundaries and all these species that are shifting over time and in different areas, what's the effect on the broader animal community? And this is a really important question because not all species are kind of shifting northward at the same time. And in fact, some are not shifting at all. And so the, although we see the majority of species showing this pattern, what's happening in terms of the community of species that we would sort of normally associate with a given area? So to answer that question, I'm going to show an example for wintering birds. So wintering birds are, have always been, in fact, going back to the 1970s and 80s, sort of this, they're a great sort of sentinel of climate change. They show a number of really specific adaptations to climate. They can go into topar, they can use sort of novel food items, uh, and many of their ranges tend to be limited by minimum temperature. They can't really kind of go past certain areas because it's just too cold. And they exist in these really important clusters or these flocks of wintering birds. Um, and so our question was, are these sort of communities changing over time? And so to answer this question, I'm gonna show you data from Project Feeder Watch. I don't know how many of you are involved in this at all, but um, I'm a huge advocate for citizen science. So the, the public sort of use or uh, collection of data. Um, and um, Feeder Watch has been a citizen science program that's been run since 1990. There's well over 12,000 people that participate uh, every year. And they've been doing this obviously for about, you know, um, over 20 years. Uh, the, what has this led to is sort of an amazing database. Each one of those blue dots you see on that map is a feeder watch site. And that's it. We're showing the huge extent of this citizen science data set in order to be able to look at how birds might differ in the winter. So feeder watch works by people kind of looking at their window and they record what birds at the species level are showing up at their feeders or anywhere in their backyard and how many they see at any given time. So if there are three chickadees that come to that feeder, then they record a maximum count the three chickadees at that feeder on that given day. So people will include information on how much they spend watching their feeders and so forth, but it's a pretty impressive data set because now we can answer that question. So if you look outside, your, outside, uh, outside at your feeder and you happen to live in the southeast, you might see sort of a, a group of birds that look a lot like this. You got cardinals and titmouse and Carolina wrens and you might have uh, goldfinches and that's sort of your regular community of birds that you might see as you feed them. If you move up in sort of geography and you live in the Mid-Atlantic, well, you might certainly have many of the same species outside your feeder, but maybe you got a couple new ones, or maybe there's more of the cardinals or fewer of the titmouse, and you start having more chickadees, you start having more juncos. And as you kind of go up, you start getting maybe a whole new assemblage of species that you wouldn't have down in the Southeast. So the question that we had was, is that over time, are we actually beginning to see the community of birds change? Are we getting sort of these subtly adapted birds moving into new areas and then moving up north? And if so, is that community of birds, sort of a novel community of birds, and are we, they becoming much more like the, the southerly counterparts? So over about a 25 year period, what we've been able to show is a reshuffling of these bird communities. That's exactly what has happened. So over time, and in conjunction with changes in minimum temperature, uh, winter temperatures, we've seen that many of these communities are becoming increasingly dominated by warm adaptive birds that happen to be a little bit smaller body. And the reason why is because these are species that tend to be much more sensitive to stuff like cold snaps but they're able to now take advantage of these warming temperatures. And at the same time, these more cold adapted species are beginning to vacate some of these communities. So we are beginning to see this reshuffling, this change in the community of birds over a 20 year period, 
And this is a really nice example in my mind because people are very familiar with the species that are outside their window. And so when we started showing the results of this, people immediately saw these as sort of perfect examples of how they experience nature. They know that there's sort of new species showing up in their backyards if they've been sort of feeding these birds for the last two decades. And so over time, we've seen this sort of really amazing reshuffling of the bird community. And what we expect to see is that this is also happening with other communities as well. So I'm happy to kind of take a quick break here and see if there are any questions. No questions, huh? Well, that's fine. I'm happy to keep going. <laughs> and we'll have another chance to, for Ben to answer questions at the end. So if you're saving them, there'll be another chance. Sounds good. Okay, so the next question then is that if we've seen these changes in ranges and these changes in communities, one of the really important aspects of conserving any sort of group of species is their demography. So, so when we talk about demography, uh, we're talking about things like their survival, their reproduction. And I tell you, studying wildlife populations, most people know uh, demographic responses are very sensitive to weather. So you can have a study that's been going on for years, and if it happens to be a cold snap or you get a drought, you can have pretty amazing changes in the demography of many of these species. Um, and so it's not necessarily surprising then that when we start thinking about how, how species might change in their demography, uh, that we would expect climate change to have an important impact. But trying to identify that sensitivity, as I kind of mentioned before, is really something of a challenge. Uh, as so an example of this, um, I'm going to focus on another species. And this is the Eastern Massasaga rattlesnake. Um, this is actually a fairly sort of timid rattlesnake uh, that was actually recently covered by CNN as sort of a disappearing species. Um, and it's a species that occupies much of the upper Midwest, they tend to be associated with kind of these upper, uh, these sort of lowland, sort of wetland cover types. Um, they do this really sort of interesting uh, behavior where during the winter, they'll kind of huddle into these hibernaculum, uh, right in sort of these sort of moist areas. And in doing so, that's where they'll kind of survive the winter. And they still actually maintain themselves in this sort of moist environment right underneath the soil surface. So potentially, they're very sensitive species. Uh, they're sensitive to things like agricultural development and they're sensitive potentially to things like uh, winter and summer drought um, because they're so dependent on that wetland habitat. So they are also increasingly endangered. And in fact, they are pretty much going to be listed uh, as an endangered species any time now. Uh, those blue dots represent where we know their current populations are. And those sort of pink dots are threatened populations, meaning like they're there, but they're just hanging on. We also have data to me on those populations where they used to be, but they are now extinct over the last 50 years. And those are those extirpated populations in the red. So one of our questions was, can we actually tease out anything in terms of their demography and how that might be influenced by climate? So for example, what you see there, those little yellow dots are actually a lot of independent studies that have looked at the survival of Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes. And this is great information. Because now we can actually look at all this survival and actually use radio telemetry to see how they do throughout the course of a year. And we can begin to build sort of advanced models that are sort of guided by climate. And so one of the things that we found right away is that their adult summer survival and their winter survival tends to be very sensitive to climate. So winter drought generally reduce their survival. When you have really high precipitation events during the summer, like flooding events, that actually reduced their survival pretty dramatically. And of course, the amount of area that was converted to our culture surrounding many of these wetland complexes also reduced their survival. So we were really interested then in terms of trying to try see whether or not we could use climate models as well as information on land cover to actually predict whether or not a population will go extinct or not. And so what we did was we did something called hind casting we would look at sort of the persistence or the probability of each population over time governed only by either climate variability in terms of that winter drought and precipitation, land cover, 
So the amount of with uh, the amount of areas surrounding these wetlands have been converted to agricultural our cultural types, and the synergistic or the interaction of both these different components, climate and land cover. And what I would say is that when we actually looked at the probability that these populations are persisting, that they hang on, that the best way we do, or at least the most accurate sort of representation of that is when we incorporate both climate and land cover. So these two components that I mentioned before are not necessarily sort of operating in isolation. It's when you actually look at these two things, habitat loss and climate, both these things have important effects, at least on the demography of this individual species. The nice thing about this, though, or at least the useful aspect from a conservation perspective, is that we can then actually model what's going to happen in the future. We know what's going to happen in terms of temperature. We have models of precipitation. And we can begin to identify which populations are going to be hanging out into the early and mid-century. This is really important, obviously, information for a species that's an endangered species. And so what we've been able to document is that this is an extirpation wave that's starting in the southwestern part of their range and is going to continue moving into the northeastern section. And this is, very, this is something that we're very much concerned about because, as you can see here, that many of those remnant populations are predicted to go extinct really by the middle of the century. And their, their range is going to be increasingly sort of captured into sort of upper Michigan as well as southern Ontario. So this is a nice example in that we've been able to identify that sensitivity, right? That climate sensitivity, they're very sensitive to winter drought. They're sensitive to summer flooding. They're sensitive to sort of the effects of land cover uh, and how it interacts with climate. And because of that, what we've been talking about with managers is whether or not you can manipulate water tables in many of these sort of conservation areas to help buffer the effect of uh, flooding as well as drought. At the same time, by incorporating information on where these populations, the type of climate these populations are going to be exposed to in the future, we can begin to identify these climate holdouts, these refugia, right? Because in the future, not all areas are going to show drought or um, um, drought during winter or summer flooding events. And so these are the areas that we really have to identify as being these important refugium for these species uh, under future climate change. Okay, so that's a one example of sort of the demography or how demography might be influenced by climate variability. The other is this idea of cycling. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, a lot of cold adapted and winter adapted species tend to show cycling phenomenon. And by that, I mean, that they kind of go up and down in terms of their populations. So some years they're just ubiquitous, they have high numbers, they have high reproduction, they do really well, and then it tends to crash. Um, and this sort of cycling phenomenon happens roughly for many of them almost at a decadal scale. They tend to do it, uh, they tend to kind of hit these pulses and then they go back down and come back up almost every nine to 11 years or so. And this is actually this type of cycling has been sort of uh, one of the major themes of ecology for a long time, trying to figure out why some species show this. A really important aspect of cycling uh, for some species uh, and these cold adapted species is that they cycle very strongly in sort of the core of their range, uh, and then they begin to break down, that cycling breaks down as you get more and more south. And the reason why this is actually something of sort of, I'd say, controversy in terms of what really drives this, but nonetheless, um, what it does tend to suggest is that climate plays a very important role, especially as species are moving closer and closer to their range boundaries. So I'm going to kind of tell you a story about rough grouse. And this is a species uh, that is, again, sort of high conservation concern. More than 50% of its populations have declined over the last several years. It is a managed species, so people do go out and hunt them. Um, but they do show this very important sort of cycling component. And there's been a number of reasons why potentially they do cycle. Uh, some people talk about predators. Some people talk about changes in plant toxicity, solar cycles, even lunar cycles. But ultimately, one of the really important aspects of this potentially is climate and how climate variability drives cycling. So again, similar to the Eastern Mossasago rattlesnake, we went out and actually looked for demographic information. So we got information on survival. We have information on how many nests and their kind of reproduction 
Uh, and all these data have been kind of collected through throughout the upper Midwest, which is one of those areas where they cycle pretty strongly. And they also are very tied in with forest. Uh, so they are a forest breeding bird, um, and they do have a number of adaptations in terms of cold as well. So similar to Eastern Massasago, where you kind of see this during winter, they seek out these hibernaculum, these sort of refugia to kind of get through the winter. Rough grouse actually do kind of a similar behavior. They actually burrow into the snow. Um, and under the snow, uh, they can actually survive sort of the winter temperatures and, uh, and, uh, and inclement weather in order to kind of get through the, the winter. They'll kind of come out, of course, to feed, but then they'll fly up and then dive back into the snow and create these little cavities under the snow. So we were really interested then in how they might be influenced by changes in the winter environment. And so we kind of had this idea then that in terms of where they expect to do best in terms of survival, uh, in terms of relationship to climate, well, they would really want to avoid warm winter conditions when you've got a lot of rain on snow events. And that, that's actually one of the main predictions of climate change is that we're going to get more rain on snow during the winter seasons. And if you're a grouse, that's not too good. Uh, the reason why that's not too good is because you kind of lose that important snowy environment. At the same time, if you're a grouse and you've actually burrowed into the snow and you get a rain on snow event, it can actually crust and freeze and you can actually be trapped under the snow. And we've actually seen this. We've uncovered uh, grouse that have actually burrowed in. Or you've got sort of, an, uh, sort of an ice scape on top and they can't get out and they starve to death. At the same time, you don't want low and cold snow conditions. Uh, so when you get really cold snaps and extreme cold snap events, um, and you have nothing really to hide or roost in, um, then that's also potentially something that could affect your survival. So you want to get right in that sweet spot. We got lots of cold, it can be cold, as long as it has high, high snow, or it can be generally warm, but in low snow conditions are when you kind of expect to see the best survival. When we looked at this relationship, that's exactly what we found more or less. Um, that in terms of their overwinter survival, it tends to be driven by this interaction of temperature and precipitation throughout the winter. And we can create these models that actually show in a spatial way where we expect to see high and low survival. And so you can do this at every time step and actually map this out. At the same time, we wanted to look at net success. And we also found this really important relationship where they tend to actually do pretty well during summers in terms of reproduction. We get sort of warmer and wetter conditions and potentially part of that has to be driven by inf um, improvements in insect biomass. And so more insects are in warm wet, uh, warm, wet conditions during summer. What you don't want is very dry conditions and very warm conditions. And again, we can get a sense of their nest success using this model as well. So not to belabor any of the details here, I just wanna kind of show you that using this information, we can then model out where we get vast numbers or large numbers of grouse over time and over space, and we can incorporate that and be able to then see whether or not cycling is changing. But the best thing that we've been able to do is actually take some of those projections and compare them to um, grouse surveys that have been conducted by state agencies. So this is a, a really interesting data set, over 300 survey routes throughout the entire upper Midwest for grouse here, um, we've, and a lot of agencies have been doing this for decades. And so we can take our models and actually compare it to the actual spring surveys they get for the grouse to see whether or not we do a good job. And lo and behold, we actually do a pretty good job. We can use climate to basically predict whether or not it's going to be a cycle year or not cycling year. And so what I kind of show you here is sort of the, the bar the, on the top there, on the very top of the figure, you actually have sort of big cycling. Those are more at the northerly latitudes. And you can see cycling begins to break down, both in terms of the monitoring data, which is there in that black line, as well as in sort of our model data, which is that red line. So it begins to sort of lose that cycling as you kind of get less and less in, uh, or sorry, lower in latitude. And the other component too, as you can see with Minnesota, just to show you how well we do in terms of capturing that cycling, which is really only driven by climate and our models, and how it corresponds with long-term uh, monitoring data. So then the question is, can we actually predict in the future what's gonna happen with cycling? So here we've got those five latitudinal bands, 
You can see starting about 2010, and we actually used future climate models to predict that cycling. And what we begin to see is more variable cycling in the northerly latitudes and a real dampening in those southerly regions. So much so that roughly about 2015, you can see there, that we're gonna see almost a loss of cycling in those mid and southerly latitudes, uh, in the most southerly bands. So we're beginning to see this real transformation of the demography of rough grouse that's being driven by the interactions of winter climate and how that's changing over time. So why would anybody care uh, in terms of dampening of these cycles? Well, what I would suggest is that we're already seeing it. Um, these cycles are really driven by very key demographic processes, survival, reproduction, and that's fundamental to any and all species. And winter climate then is very critical, at least for this species, for being able to sort of uh, capture the changes in their demography. And in 1964, 2015, you can see here across time, those are real count data from uh, monitoring data for grouse, that in the upper sort of parts of Wisconsin, the cycling is holding true. Let's see what's happening in the south. We're seeing that cycling beginning to diminish, dampen, and then we're seeing a complete collapse of their populations. So this is a real concern, especially for people who try to manage cycling species, because there's sort of an inherent belief that cycling species will always rebound, that they'll kind of dampen, that you'll see a loss of cycling, but then it'll kind of come back as would any cycle. Um, but I think what we're beginning to document is that the climate change has been so unique um, that has really pushed these species into populations have actually begun to sort of disintegrate what is a sort of unique demographic processes that drive that population cycling. And over time then, I'd see that these sort of cryptic declines in cycling species really are an important harbinger for what we're gonna see in the future. So I, I hope this was useful in that I've been able to sort of document sort of how species might respond to climate change, both in terms of their ranges, their communities, and their demography. Um, we've been able, or what we're trying to do now, is trying to get a better sense of those two components of vulnerability sensitivity, exposure. How sensitive are species to climate? And, that, and some species are not. Uh, some are more or less sensitive. At the same time, which populations are going to be more or less exposed to that future climate change? What I would say is that there is undoubtedly interactions with habitat loss. That we can't look at these two things as I like to think about almost test tube science, that we're only looking at climate change or we're only looking at habitat loss it is inevitable that these two components of what we're doing to the Earth is actu are actually interacting. And at the same time, we have to start understanding and identifying what, are going, what areas are going to be serving as important refugia for species. What we're already seeing is that we're getting no analog communities. And by that, I mean we're getting communities of species that we've never seen interacting or forming um, in the past. Uh, so these are unique communities of species, and because of that, we really don't know what to expect in terms of predicting how these communities are going to change over time. There ultimately will be winners in the climate change game. Um, that there's gonna, many of those species tend to be species that can adapt, they have short generation times, they have wide distributions, they can sort of occupy a number of different kinds of habitats, and potentially are not sensitive to human activity. Um, and I would suggest that many of these species will probably benefit in many ways uh, to climate change, especially when we start thinking about winter habitats. But there are those species that we're particularly concerned about. Uh, these are species that take a long time to reproduce, that they can't really disperse very well, that they have narrow distributions or ranges, and they have potentially very special requirements. And these are the species that, that change in terms of that climate space is gonna be particularly worrisome. So what I would say moving forward is that we need to begin to fit that climate lens to conservation. These are all aspects of what we do in climate and wildlife management in terms of natural areas management, habitat management, translocation, predator reintroduction. But all of this has to be under the guise now of climate change because now the uncertainty of how these different tools will impact species and their environments is only increasing.
So what are some of the obstacles then to this sort of climate smart conservation? Well, many of course are external to our community. Uh, I live in a state where we've seen a pretty amazing change and sort of just the politics behind climate. Uh, it can change from year to year and it changed certainly by election cycle. Um, but these are pretty important um, obstacles, I would say, primarily because it detracts from what needs to happen in terms of a larger uh, conservation conversation about how to incorporate climate change into what we do. And I would also say, though, that there are obstacles even within our own communities of conservation, that these are quotes I've heard talk from managers all over. Adaptation mitigation are different things. We can only do adaptation. We can't really think about mitigation. Or thinking about climate change really is diverting resources from more urgent problems, uh, such as invasive species control or habitat loss. And so it's just not important within the time scale of our management. Solutions really only exist at broader scale. This is interesting stuff, but there's nothing I can do as a manager uh, on my own land uh, that can really help in terms of trying to come up with an effective solution. And ultimately, you can't talk about climate change without talking about communication. Um, and this is what we know time and again. Um, nature and climate change communication is absolutely essential to putting forth your message. Um, but we still have a number of people in our field and in management and conservation where they just say, look, communication's not what we do. Uh, and that will ultimately be a shortcoming to anything we try to implement on the ground. So I'll leave you with kind of three numbers here. What you see is 0 0.8. Um, that is basically the amount of warming we've seen throughout the Earth over the last 100 years or so, an increase of about 0 0.8. Everything that I've talked to to date right now, all those examples I gave, all the research, all the money, all the conservation that has been sort of hinting or trying to address the problem of modern climate change has been in reflection and in response to that number, 0 0.8. That number would be, is the amount of warming we expect to see over the next 100 years across the Earth if we stop fossil fuel emissions tomorrow. That number is the amount of warming we expect to see if everything just goes as is. And so I would put that into perspective a little bit, that what we've seen over the last 100 years, again, pales in comparison to what we expect to see over the next 100 years. But there are reasons to hope, uh, and I think that me talking today and others who are carrying the same message uh, and of course, you joining us and all the work that the Natural Areas Association does uh, really is part of this larger communication that needs to happen, uh, both among scientists as well as people on the ground and practitioners. Uh, because without that sort of conversation, without going out and actually trying to estimate some of the sort of the background and vulnerability of how species might respond to climate change, um, we really are fighting a losing battle. And so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people who have helped out, a lot of the managers, agencies that I work with, as well, of course, many of the grad students and postdocs in my lab who actually do all this really fun work. Uh, and um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Looks like there's a couple questions that came up on the Q&A. Ben, can you see those? Sure. Um, OK, got it. Yep. Uh, Dina asked, are certain families of birds more sensitive to climate change? What types of species are more susceptible to heat waves or weather extremes? That's a really good question. Um, what I would say is that um, it's still something that I would say is, is uh, we're trying to find that, uh, that holy grail of what, uh, what characteristics of birds make them more sen sensitive to climate change. What I would say is that um, Wetland breeding birds do tend to be one of those groups that we're particularly concerned about. Uh, that when we start talking about shifts uh, in terms of their ranges, though that group of species does tend to kind of be one of the more important ones. Um, grassland birds is another one. And the reason why I point out grassland birds is because they're actually, out of all the groups of species that we see, um, they are not moving forward. They're not showing that northward shift. And so one may say, well, then that's a good thing. But Part of what we're thinking is going on 
is that they are one of the groups of species that are just the most habitat limited. They're, they're living in such a modified landscape. Uh, tall grass prairie has been declining throughout the U.S. by 99%. They just don't have enough habitat to move into, so you're almost getting this bookend effect. Um, in terms of what makes species susceptible to certain weather extremes, like heat waves or drought is an important one. Um, I'd kind of say that, again, species that are occupying um, unbuffered environments, and by that I mean kind of, again, wetland and grassland species I'm particularly concerned about. Um, because when you do have these heat waves or weather extremes, all those things actually tend to be sort of moderated in one form or another by things like microclimates. And when you've got really flat, open expanses of land, um, these are really unbuffered ecosystems. And so they are going to be the most susceptible to variability, these big extreme events. Um, and other species, too, tend to be smaller body species when you start thinking about like cold snaps. And so species like Carolina wren that are more subtly adapted, uh, when you get these cold snaps, you can have pretty amazing declines in their populations. So what I would say is uh, species that are very specific to certain habitat types, uh, that are like open grassland uh, or wetland, um, as well as species that tend to be smaller body species, they're always going to be just more physiologically sensitive to variability in climate. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, in terms of studies um, with populations that do not migrate, who's looking at climate change effects on migration and what's being discovered? Okay. Yes, that's a good, that's a great question. So um, definitely a lot of my work tends to focus on birds that uh, don't migrate, although we do do uh, work on phenology as well. Um, there's um, a fair amount of research out there on what's referred to as phenological mismatch. Um, and the idea here is actually perfectly sort of suited to that, um, so that's no issue here, example, is that the migration patterns for many neotropical migrants or migratory birds tends to be driven, for the most part, uh, by day lengths. And so they start, go, you know, knowing when to uh, come back from their overwintering grounds in Central and South America based primarily on day lengths. Um, and the real problem here is, is that in many areas, we're seeing a warming, especially in spring phenology, um, where insect populations are coming out uh, earlier and earlier and earlier in response to sort of earlier springs. Um, and so for resident birds, for short distance migrants, uh, they can tend to kind of be able to track that a little bit better. Neotropical migrants that start their journey way down in South America or Central America can't. And so by the time they kind of get here, uh, they are mismatched with an important resource, which are the insects. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily uh, influence the, their survival, but it influences the survival of their chicks because they kind of really do depend on this pulse of insects, especially caterpillars, uh, for feeding their chicks. Uh, and so this idea of a phenological mismatch or mismatch in phenology is something that we are concerned about. Um, and definitely those species or populations that have shown stronger phenological mismatch are showing pretty uh, strong uh, declines in their populations. Um, so certainly neotropical migrants or migratory species that can't keep up with the change in their breeding grounds in terms of the phenology of their resources are a big uh, concern. Anybody else have some questions for Ben? If not, uh, oh, we got one more from Renee. Okay, so Renee, what is your advice to managers regarding how to talk about the change they are seeing given their situation political context? Do you know of any helpful resources? Communication is critical to secure funding support. Well, I couldn't agree more. Um, do I have any advice on that? Um, it, is, it, is, it is problematic. Um, and what I would say is that sometimes the message has to be altered a little bit depending on whatever political community you're working in. And um, we've actually become experts at that, of uh, trying to talk about environmental change as opposed to climate change. Um, and so there does tend to be some of that uh, code switching in terms of how you're talking about climate change. Um, there are some really good resources out there. At least I know for uh, um, um, national level, there's the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, they've got a really 
um, great document on climate change adaptation. Um, I know here in our own state, we've done Wiki, which is the Wisconsin Initiative for Climate Change Impact, which has a lot of good information as well. Um, so there are documents out there on how to sort of think about climate change adaptation. What, what I would say, um, at least where we've been particularly successful, is that um, mitigation tends to be a tougher sell. Um, Climate change adaptation is a little bit more digestible by some political groups. Um, and the, the reason tends to be that, well, we are talking about adaptation. Um, and people tend to think about that in a sort of a more holistic way, that things are going to change. How do we go about adapting to that change? Um, and so I think that kind of message tends to resonate a little bit more. I would also always say that trying to make these stories or um, these examples more pertinent to whatever crowd or audience um, that you're interested in communicating with uh, really goes a long way. Um, when people can kind of see climate change as being something that's occurring in their own backyards, um, I think they tend to resonate more in terms of support. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, amazing questions, amazing stuff. Um, really a lot to think about <laughs> in, that, in, that, uh, in that presentation. Um, I've just got a couple things to add to some of, for some of you who are sticking around. Uh, let's see, get to my slides here. Um, Obviously, thanks to Ben for taking the time to give this presentation. Um, thanks to all you guys for coming and, and watching it. Um, for those of you who are interested in a video archive, that is going to be up on our uh, Natural Areas Association YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. Yes, I'm going to commit to that. Yes, 48 hours. <laughs> so um, it'll be up there. Um, I also, for some of you who have... Um, follow-up emails coming to you from our uh, Zoom system. I, I'm going to try to get the link in there as soon as I can. Uh, watch your email for information on our webinar registration. One more plug, of course, for our Natural Areas Conference. Um, I hope you all, we, I see you guys all there. Um, it's going to be a lot like this, but even more so. So uh, that's something to look forward to. Again, thanks to everybody. Uh, you can always follow up with me at um, kangel at naturalareas.org. And again, thanks to everybody. We'll see you in November.